Welcome back to another episode of The Founder, a show that features entrepreneurs and their early stories of ingenuity, struggle, and perseverance to get their companies off the ground. We do our best to capture the uncensored, uncovered look behind the curtain into what founders really face when getting started. I'm your host, Callaway. Our founder guest on today's episode is a serial entrepreneur and hustler, getting his start at Boston University and becoming somewhat of a legend as a club promoter in the area. After a while, he began to engage with local businesses who wanted to advertise at his events and leverage his network of 75 college student promoters to help promote their businesses. That was the foundation for his first marketing agency, The Magma Group. After a couple of twists and turns and the dot-com crash in 2000, he ultimately started a second agency called Mr. Youth, which later rebranded to MRY, a full-stack marketing company and one of the first to run social marketing for big brands in 2009 and 10. As a part of MRY, he built a software called CrowdTap to manage and incentivize a massive network of college reps, not too unlike the network of college promoters he had built in his early days. CrowdTap was the foundation for the business he runs today, called Suzy. Today at Suzy, this founder and his team have built a software platform that enables companies, both large and small, to rapidly access and engage consumers in real time to help drive better business decisions. The Suzy team and business are growing like crazy, looking like a rocket ship in the market research industry and sporting over 100 employees and 250 enterprise customers. In a digital first landscape with rapidly changing consumer sentiment, companies like Suzy are the future of market research. This is an inspiring interview that spotlights a serial entrepreneur who was able to identify trends throughout youth communities, digital and social marketing, and knew how to take advantage. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Now introducing the founder of Suzy, Matt Britton. Let's get it. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really pumped to talk about Suzy today and, and hear about your overall experience as an entrepreneur. So what I like to do is before we get into the story, can you just provide an anchor point to Suzy? You know, what, what's the mission vision of the company? What are the products you sell today? How big is the company? Sure. So Suzy is a software company um, that empowers large organizations, enterprises to be able to put their finger on the pulse of the consumer by accessing a tool that allows them to talk to consumers in real time. So you're a brand that sells any type of product or service, and you want to get feedback on an idea, on packaging, on pricing, you can ask the right type of consumer. And before you leave that meeting or that Zoom call, you can get feedback from consumers on that concept. And, and how, many, how many employees you know, or any other KPI that you measure for growth is the company today? Yeah. So we are growing at about 80% uh, a year. We have 100 employees. Uh, we were founded in just 2018, so not that long ago. Um, we have over 250 enterprise customers, and uh, we see nothing but growth ahead as well. Yeah, moving fast. Cool. So I think that'll be a great anchor point for people as we, as we kind of build up to it. So let's, let's rewind the clock a bit. You know, as fast or as slow as you'd like, take us through your journey and your background. You're the quintessential serial entrepreneur. You've you founded a bunch of companies. So take us through that journey leading up to uh, when you started Suzy. Sure. Well, I guess I can take it back to my college days. I went to school at Boston University and um, I too quickly turned into a nightclub promoter. Uh, Boston is a great place to um, be in the nightlife industry because at least before this whole crisis hit, uh, because there are so many colleges and such a dense population um, of kids that just wanted to go out and have fun. And over the course of four years, I built a bit of an empire um, in the Boston area, targeting the over um, 100 colleges and universities in that area. Um, I was doing anywhere between uh, 30 to 40 uh, events a month and doing well enough that I went home one year during the holidays and bought myself a car with cash and my parents thought I was doing something illegal. Um, what I loved about nightclub promoting was really just seeing my ability to impact people's decisions. Me going up to somebody and selling them one-on-one -on -one with a flyer in my hand on why they should come to my event and then actually seeing them show up there a couple of days later. And there was something about that experience that ended up being really appealing to me and really magnetic. And because of it, I thought, you know, maybe this is my calling, not necessarily nightclub running, but marketing in general. Uh, what started to happen at my senior year of college is a lot of uh, local venues, you know, uh, pizza places, florists, 
you name it, ask me if they could sponsor my parties. Can they put their logo on my flyer, um, set up a table at my event, hang up a banner at my event? And it was a pathway for me to start working with local businesses. And a lot of these local businesses then start to ask me, can we use your network of promoters? Because I built at this point a network of 50, 75 kids around the Boston area who are promoting my events. Can we use them to promote our business? And I was like, oh, sounds like a great idea. And that kind of became the impetus for my first business. They ended up launching out of college called the Magma Group. At that time, it was the year 2000, which was right when the internet was first becoming sort of a mainstream you know, consumer habit. And there was a whole batch of new startups, one of which was eBay, uh, which is obviously still around, but there are other companies like Lycos and food.com that are no longer around, all of which want to target college students. And I started to reach out to them because I read the news that you know these are the companies with all the money, and they started to pay me to not only market in the Boston area, but nationally. And my first agency, the Magma Group, I called it the Magma Group because I was watching Austin Powers, and they say <laughs> liquid hot magma, and that's why I called it the Magma Group built very quickly. And we got to about 5 million in revenue within my first 18 months of leaving college. Wow. But then the dot-com bubble burst. And what ended up happening is I, I was left with a lot of receivables from these big internet companies uh, that never paid me. So I was paying the students to promote these internet companies on the premise that these big companies or companies I thought were big, were going to be paying their bills. They didn't. Uh, and they got into a little bit of trouble and um, ended up having to call a couple of larger companies in the youth marketing space, essentially getting a bailout. And there was a company called Alloy in New York that agreed to assume my debt, give me what's essentially a signing bonus and allowed me to move to New York. Uh, all my friends who I grew up with that I sold my company, <laughs> the reality is I didn't sell it. I, I, I got a bailout and you know we had built a great business, but the lesson learned is you have to diversify your customer base. And we were anything but diversified. Um, I went to go work for that company for a couple of years, really learned the ropes of how to work with more substantial companies like Procter & Gamble and Coca-Cola. And at that point thought I knew enough to really start what I knew would be my first substantive business called Mr. Youth. And that was in 2002. So it was kind of the first chapter. I, I, I'll say, we'll call it the chapter of hard knocks, right? You, you, you know, starting with knowing nothing and, you know, thinking that you were going to take over the world and having a business and then getting punched in the face. Uh, but it kind of, that learning lesson really prepared me for the next phase of my career. Yeah, chapter one, the rise and then fall, yeah. the, the classic model. And then from there, so you started Mr. Youth and was that a kind of a slow build year over year or you know, t take us through that story as well? Sure, so what happened with Mr. Youth, so I was at this company, at the company that kind of bailed me out of my first business and I built some really strong relationships, one of which was with Red Bull and Red Bull was just being launched at that point. And I'll never forget the day I saw all these people in suits walking into this business I was working at and I was like, who are these people? And someone's like, oh, they're buying us. And I thought to my, in my mind, wait, I don't have control over this. Now I'm gonna be working for another company this is not the path for me. I'm not going to work at a company and let somebody else determine one day I'm going to be working for another company. Like I, I, I'm not going to do this. So I basically start to call all the clients, including Red Bull that I'd been working with and basically said, I'm leaving. Who's coming with me? Almost like Jerry Maguire status, right? <laughs> yeah. And Red Bull, I mentioned them because they were one of the brands that went with me along with Intel and a couple other brands. And so I had customers to start off uh, you know, Mr. Youth with some pretty big brands. And it was, you know, it was a grind. I, I started Mr. Youth uh, working out of my apartment in the Upper West Side of New York. I would answer my phone with a different voice, uh, pretending like I had a secretary answer, but it was really just my bedroom. You know, there was no really a we work back then. It was, you know, everything was happening uh, within eyesight of my bed, right? And I started one by one to pick off uh, clients, get referrals. And finally, uh, about a year and a half later, was able to get an office um, in New York City. And, you know, it was just a very long, arduous road over a 10, 12 year period. Um, some of the big pivotal moments of the business um, were first and foremost, um, in 2005, one of my employees who went to Columbia uh, said, have you heard of this thing, Facebook, we should have our student reps promote our clients over Facebook. And I said, what is that? He gave me his old college.edu email address because that was the only way you could log into Facebook. Um, and basically, you know, seeing something in that platform, trying to get in touch with them to see if we could partner with them. There was no phone number. So I went to do their domain registry, saw a 617 number, 
dialed it and Mark Zuckerberg picked up the phone and he was in my office the next day. Um, and literally on an Amtrak, him and his partner, Eduardo, selling me on why we should bring um, the clients who we were working with at that point onto Facebook, um, selling the hell out of a very nascent platform. Um, at one point, uh, me turning down the offer to work for them in very early stages because I was so into my agency. In retrospect, not the best decision. What a crazy story. Crazy story. But that opened my eyes up to the power of social media because since we were working with them, I started to see how they were growing. Ended up pivoting my business from being called Mr. Youth to MRY in 2009 as I saw an opportunity for us to not only service our clients and target in the youth market, but really to understand and, and execute on the social media discipline as a whole. Uh, ended up being Coca-Cola's first ever uh, social media agency of record um, in 2010. And that really exploded our business for the next couple of years where we went from uh, you know 50 employees at a time to over 300, at which point the agency was acquired by a, a multinational company called LBI um, in 2011. And that was kind of, so it was, a, it was a lot of kind of twists and turns. And running an agency is, is a grind because you know, a service business is hard because ultimately the biggest customers always wanted me and our top, you know, our top staffs, which meant jumping on a plane, spending lots of time with clients. It wasn't necessarily as scalable as the business that I'm in now, but certainly something that was an incredible ride. And, you know, we built a lot of value over a significant period of time. Yeah, I was going to ask you. So uh, that's where I was going with it. Were you doing like full stack marketing, digital marketing, social marketing? It sounds like you're doing really the gamut, whatever the clients needed. Yes, yeah, strategy, creative. Uh, you know, community management, analytics, uh, a little bit of media buying, video production, you know, across the board. Uh, our largest client we ever had in the life cycle of the agency was Visa, uh, who we were doing over $20 million in business with alone, uh, managing, you know, social media platforms in 36 different countries and activating uh, for FIFA World Cup and uh, the Super Bowl and the Olympics and things like that. Yeah, big, big deals. Yeah. That's awesome. So I would love to get your perspective on, you know, Today, everybody does digital social marketing and it seems so easy because these the Googles, the Facebooks have built all these tools to make it so easy to understand yeah. and, and deploy. You were in it at the beginning stages when they were still building the plane as it was flying. Yep. How hard was it to figure out what to do? Like, like There really was no playbook, right, on social marketing or anything? Well, it was much easier back then because there was not many people doing it. So the idea back then was the medium. It's like being on Facebook was an idea in itself. So we were able to pitch brands and say, hey, here's an idea. Let's go on Facebook, right? So now the medium is not the idea anymore. The idea is the content. Uh, and now while everyone, it's been democratized in terms of your ability to reach consumers of social media, uh, what still becomes elusive to so many different businesses of all sizes is how to create content that people care about, that they want to engage with, and that what's going to move the needle in their business. And so many people and companies have still not figured that out to date. And so, okay, so then you went from the agency, uh, and that was that was a tough lifestyle, which makes sense. And then from there, you pr that was that was like 2013 or so, right? You progressed because you didn't start Suzy till 2018. So what happened after that? So the story behind Suzy is actually has a strong connective tissue to MRY. So what happened at around two, 2008, 2009 is we had this massive network of college student reps. Not that dissimilar to what I was doing back in college, right? But that business had really scaled, and we had built software to manage and measure and incentivize these student reps to the various clients. And that software is called CrowdTap. And what started to happen was many different clients, um, agencies, publishers were asking, can we just license your software? And a light bulb went off my head. Well, maybe this is a whole nother business opportunity. And I decided to actually spin out CrowdTap into its own company, put in a CEO. So I would go on to build the agency and sell it, but that business was not included in that transaction. I stayed on the board of it, um, helped manage the business from afar. After I ended up my, uh, you know, ending my earnout with um, Publicis Group, who actually ended up acquiring the company that acquired me, um, the board asked me to come back and become CEO of CrowdTap. That was in late 2016. I instantly saw that, that business was struggling. It wasn't going in the right direction. And But what they had built was this really highly engaged network of over a million U.S. consumers on this platform called CrowdTap, who at that point were earning points for creating and sharing content. As it turns out, after talking to a lot of CrowdTap's customers, the only ones that were really happy with the platform were using CrowdTap for a different purpose. Instead of them tapping into CrowdTap's network to, to get content created and shared, 
they were actually using the CrowdTap platform to gain insights from consumers. So light bulb went off my head. You know what? This is actually the business opportunity. So I'm going to create a whole new brand called Suzy that's going to sit on top of the CrowdTap network. It's going to focus on one thing and one thing only, offering companies of all sizes the abilities to gather these real-time insights, and we're going to launch it. And that's what we ended up doing. We launched Suzy a year later, um, you know, March 2018 at South by Southwest, and you know we've been sort of on fire ever since. But the impetus of that business and the origins date all the way back to really my nightclub promoting days in college. <laughs> Uh, it really, you know, it's interesting how there's that connective thread. Yeah. Everything comes full circle. It sounds like. Yeah, for sure. Walk us through, like if I'm a, if I'm a customer, if I'm a brand and I want to do research on Suzy, what's the process that I, I go through with the product platform today and paint the picture in three to five years, you know, where do you want the product to evolve to? Yeah. So really what we focused on with Suzy is a relentless simplification. We want it to be simple, easy to use to the extent that you know, I have a 14 year old daughter, she knows how to use Suzy and it should be that simple. And if you look at the most successful software products in history, one thing that they all have in common is it's simple and easy to use. And ultimately, if you look at the notion of market research, it's really just about connecting the asker and the teller and taking the information that the teller has told you in aggregate, right? Because there could be a thousand or a million tellers and allowing people to make decisions based upon that. That's all market research is. And we were in the fortunate position to have this network of a million tellers, right? These, uh, this crowd tap network that were highly engaged. Um, so really when we were building Suzy, the goal was really just how can we put a platform on top of it that, you know, on top of the crowd tap network called Suzy that would be easy to use and easy for companies to jump on and ask the right consumer the right question at the right time and get answers back. So with the Suzy platform, it's incredibly easy not only to use, but to do business with us. Uh, we sell annual licenses. Uh, the licenses start at anywhere from, say, $1,000 a month for small businesses to uh, up to $100,000 a month for large enterprise companies uh, who are using it across multiple different departments. Uh, the users are given a login, and when they log in, they essentially see a dashboard. And on that dashboard is any question they've ever asked in the past, as well as the ability to ask a new question. Uh, the reason why all the questions you've ever asked in the past is important is you can go back to those questions and then retarget based upon how people answered. So, you know, say a year ago, somebody told you they owned a Tesla, you can go back to the people a year later and ask them how they liked their Tesla or if they're going to buy a new one or whatever it may be. Um, the question asking process is as simple as can be. Um, it takes less than 30 seconds to launch a question. Uh, you can ask questions in a variety of different um, kind of formats, whether it be open-ended or multiple choice or grids or scales. Um, you type the question, you type who you want to target to, you press the button that says Ask Susie, and instantly, and I mean instantly, you start seeing answers come back on the screen um, from the consumers you're targeting. So you could be in a meeting, you could be on a Zoom call, and you're trying to understand if consumers like the red, white, or blue dress better, and you'll start to instantly find out. And then you can dig deeper based upon that information. And it's really just that simple. Yeah, it's, it's as real time as research can get, it seems. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. One thing I wanted to ask you about, so I, I've seen, you know, you do a lot of speaking and in some of the speeches that I've seen, you target kind of the, the millennial consumer and your, sure. your awareness and understanding of the demographic. And I think, you know, being a millennial myself, we, we do get a bad, a bad rap sometimes from, from different people. I'd love you to take, take us through kind of what are the truths behind, you know, you, you're an expert on the, on the generation, essentially. What are the truths that you've seen through all your marketing and research and, and how has that driven the way you've built Suzy? So, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, the origins of that is just, I was so focused on what's just called the new consumer ever since I started Mr. Youth in terms of how there was this new consumer that was adopting something called the internet first, and then adopting something called the iPod first, and then the iPhone first, and then social media first, and on and on and on. And all these new innovations adopted by young consumers ended up really driving the future of culture and society and business, where if you look at the 50s and 60s, the adults were making all the decisions and the, 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 the decisions about the future were made from the boardroom. Now they're made from the sidewalks. Um, it was all those learnings that drove me to write a book called Youth Nation, which was a best-selling book that really was meant to provide a roadmap for companies of all sizes to really be able to decode this notion that our world is being driven by the younger population. Um, and I think I tried to 
kind of embrace the tenets and philosophies of that book, obviously in everything I do in business, you know, I eat my own dog food, so to speak. Um, some of the things I believe are most important is first and foremost, advertising really doesn't work. Content works. So what's the difference? Advertising is companies saying we're 30% more absorbent. We have, you know, 350 horsepower, you know, we're 10% faster, whatever it may be. Consumers tune out to that. The only reason it worked in the past is that it, those type of messages were displayed on linear television where consumers didn't have TiVo or didn't have Apple TV and they couldn't fast forward. They had to watch it. They had to watch it. Now they don't and they don't care. What does work is companies figuring out how to add value to consumers. You talk about Red Bull. Red Bull has embraced the notion of being extreme uh, because they feel it connects to their brand and they've invested you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of content that consumers actually want to seek out. And they connect the value of that content to the Red Bull brand, and it changes their um, both perception and intent when they're in a grocery store or Walmart to actually grab a Red Bull, right? So content works, advertising doesn't. So what that means for us is when we talk about Suzy, we try to create content. So since the pandemic, we've created about 25 webinars for free, very in-depth studies about everything from the future of e-commerce to what the back-to-school landscape is this September. And we've had thousands and tens of thousands of prospects and major brands sign up because they find that information valuable. We don't charge them for it. But what we do is we see who signs up and the people who spend a lot of time with these webinars, we engage them and we reach out to them and say, can we tell you about Susie? And we've earned the ability to do that. And that's the complete opposite approach than most brands, which is let's take our message that's most important to us, the advertiser, and cram it down our consumer's throat until they basically wave the white flag and buy our stuff. That just doesn't work anymore. And I think whether you're marketing software to big businesses or trying to sell energy drink to 16-year-old boys, right? It's the same approach that really works. Yeah. And, and a question I was going to ask you next, which that, that hits on a lot of it was, you know, if you put your if you put your marketing hat on, what are companies, startups in particular, doing wrong today that they could be doing better? I feel like a lot of what you what you just framed most of the big companies are getting that wrong. They're focused on the advertising yep. versus the content. A lot of the startups are now more nimble and, and realize the content strategy first. But in your you know marketing generalist opinion, what do you think are some things that startups could be doing better to market more effectively? I think most startups don't realize the value of a brand. And it, that's not necessarily their fault because we live in a world where you know I've done a lot of fundraising for Suzy and I get it. Startups are most focused on funding. And they get funding from venture capitalists who really don't care for the most part about the value of the brand. They just care about what your last, you know, two or three quarters numbers look like, right? So it's, it's a very short-term outlook for most entrepreneurs. And building a brand is the exact opposite of that. It's a long-term outlook. Right. But if you had a new entrant um, into, uh, you know, to try to compete with Coca Cola, it did, wouldn't matter how much they would spend on bottom funnel activities. They would not be able to push out Coca Cola from the shelves because of the power of that brand. The same thing exists in software. Right. And uh, what we really tried to do is think long term. And we spend uh, more money on top funnel activities like the webinar, you know, content idea, or whether it's just general branding um, related content than we do on just pounding going for the sale. Uh, because the, the, the more trust you gain in your brand, the easier it will be to sell. So I think that's the biggest mistake that a lot of startups make is, you know, obviously they don't have the patience. They try to sell, sell, sell right away. And in doing that, not only are they alienating their prospects, but they're missing a big opportunity over that same time period to gain widespread awareness of their mission and their vision and, and why they exist as a business. It'll be interesting to see in, in you know, five to 10 years, I feel like there's so many brands, so many consumer recognized brands that are coming out. And I, and I wonder if there is a, an asymptote there where like consumers can only you know, resonate with so many brands before they're overloaded. I think the cream will always rise to the yeah. top. So if there's more competition, there's more competition. But we're seeing a lot that renaissance, I think now with the brand focused, a lot of these startups direct well, consumer. I think, I think it's going to be a lot like the music industry. So you look at you know, um, where the music industry was in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. And it's like whatever clear channel was spinning up on heavy rotation, like, you know, Britney Spears or the Backstreet Boys, like, you know, they became some of the biggest selling albums of all time because consumers yeah. didn't have choice, 
right? Now with Spotify, you haven't had any of the top 50 albums of all time in the last 10 years because there's just too much choice for consumers. Um, but the, but if you ask any individual consumer who are their top five favorite artists are, they'll be able to tell you, but it's most likely not going to be anything that's in the same list from the next consumer you talk to. And I think the same thing is going to happen with branding in general is that there's just going to be much more fragmentation in almost every category as the barriers to entry have been lower and opportunity has been democratized. You know, look at Amazon. It's like you can you you, you can sell sneakers or you can sell, um, you know, uh, sparkling water or you can sell T-shirts without having to be a multi-billion dollar company. Right. You could just go on something like Shopify and sell directly. So it's been, everything's been democratized. So there could be a lot more brands and they could all do well. There might not just be as many behemoths. Yeah, exactly. And I, it's going to be interesting to, to watch. A question I want to ask you is around the competitive landscape. So this is a space that I have, I have knowledge in. And I know, you know, from a research perspective, it feels like there's a new rapid research, you know, type platform popping up yep. every month or two months. And, and it's becoming a crowded space you obviously had what a lot of them don't, which is the supply side users mm -hmm. to actually provide the feedback, which is a huge differentiation point. How do you see that competitive landscape shifting over time and, and kind of where do you where do you feel like Suzy fits today? Sure, it's a great question. And, and I speak a lot with my executive team about how to look at competitors. Um, there is a photo, a very famous photo of Michael Phelps during the last Olympics, where he's looking straight ahead at the finish line and the competitor to his right that's slightly behind him is looking at Michael Phelps, right? Yeah. And I always tell our team, we want to be Michael Phelps. We don't want to be the guy to the right. I don't even know the guy to the right's name, and that's almost the point in itself, right? Um, but w the reason why Michael Phelps was able to stare straight is he knew that he had done the preparation and the work, and as long as he put that in, he was going to be able to win, right? And I believe the same thing about our company. Um, but more specifically and getting more tactically and unbundling that point is that if you look at our industry market research, which is a $50 billion industry, only five to 7% of all that revenue actually exists within software companies. About 95 to 93% of that revenue exists with sleepy legacy incumbents, businesses that have been around for 10, 20, 50 years. We could all, all of the software companies in our space do incredibly well over the next five to 10 years and not really have to beat each other up because there's so much business to be taken from the old guard, the companies that can't move fast enough. So one, that's one part of the answer why I don't really worry about competition. The second and more tactical answer for our business is we really are obsessed about unit economics, meaning our, we have SDRs, sales development representatives that send out emails. We look at the conversion rates for every thousand emails, what percentage of people respond? Right. As long as that number is not going down, and in fact, ours is going up, it means at the top of the funnel, we're not being impacted by competitors because there are more competitors than was impacting us. Less people will respond because they would be responding to other competitors. Then after we talk to those people, how many of those initial conversations are turning to opportunities? Right. And then how many opportunities are we winning? So we are benchmarking and tracking that religiously on a monthly basis. So instead of me worrying about competitors, I'm actually looking at our numbers and trying to improve our numbers. And as long as our numbers are at the same level or improving, then I have a go-to-market model that can scale over time, no matter who else is in the market. So I really let the data and the science drive what I think about versus, and I'll tell you like every day, whether it's one of our investors or a friend or something, you should check out this company. And my response is always, well, why would I check them out? I'd rather check in with a customer and ask them, how they're feeling about our product and how we can grow. So I'm all about checking in over checking out, right? Checking in with our customers versus checking out competitors. Yeah, I, lo I love that answer. That's the data-driven approach to competition is, I feel like not a lot of people approach it that way. Everybody's yeah. always looking around and, and you're right, that distracts you, you spend time outside of what really matters. And it's like, and then what? Like, you should check out this competitor. Great, so I'm gonna go down a rabbit hole, spend the next two hours looking at everybody else, thinking they're better than me, when I can just spend those two hours talking to our top five customers and expanding them. Yeah, you'll either dismiss it and waste two hours or worry and waste more than two hours. Right. Now, my product team really does spend a good deal of time looking at the competitive landscape. And I think that's completely healthy because they want to understand what's possible, what else is out there, what type of user experience makes the most sense, et cetera. Totally cool. But for our people who are focused on building the business, you know, on the commercial side, I, I, I don't 
really like focusing on that area. I think it'd be a huge distraction and for, and frankly creates room for excuses. It's a good point on the product team too, because you know, who's going to come up with more innovation, five people in one company or 50 people across 10 companies, it's probably going to be 50 people across 10 companies. So if, if the people in your company keep their head up and are looking around and seeing what people are doing, you almost get like tangential innovation or tangential right. ideas from that. So I, I totally agree. It's also, it's also just about execution. You know, who can execute? Like it, it, I could, there could be everybody in the world can go in our space. Who's really going to execute day in and day out. Who's going to hire, train and empower the right people. Who's going to build those strong relationships with customer. Who's going to evolve the, the, the mission of the business and the product alongside of it to, to react to market conditions. That's very few can do that, which is why, although there are so many competitors in so many hot markets, only a few stand apart, right? And I believe we are going to be one of those companies and we're already well on our way. Totally agree. Um, all right, we're going to shift to kind of the second bucket of questions. Pumped to get into these ones as well, learn more about kind of you and your philosophy. So the first one is, is around hiring. And, you know, people who have listened to the show from the beginning, they're going to get sick of me saying this, but I think hiring is the most important thing you can do. And when you get superstars on your team, they run the ship for you. They, you know, they control the outcome. So when you, when you look to hire, what have been the consistent qualities across the superstars that you've been able to find? So one thing that has always popped up during interview questions is, are people taking credit and are they using the word me or my, or are they using the word us and our team for whatever business they're coming from? Anytime I've interviewed somebody and they talk about how all the things they did themselves they end up being an employee that is selfish, not somebody who's focused on the success of the company, but more on the success of themselves. And even if they're talented, aren't really a good fit from our culture. So I think it's really somebody that understands the value of a team and, you know, that no one does it alone. And, you know, you look at LeBron James in basketball and he needs his role players to hit those big three point shots down the stretch. It doesn't matter how much you can do it. At a certain point, he's going to have to rely on one of his teammates. The same exists with business, uh, no matter what role you're in. I think a huge uh, you know, marker of people who are successful at startups or really any organization is somebody who takes initiative, which means it's somebody who's not waiting for permission to being told what to do, but somebody who sees a problem and goes after it on their own. And how do you know if somebody can take initiative when you're interviewing? You ask them to show you something that they've built. Show me, a, show me your blog, show me a project you've done, show me something that you've created. I don't care if it failed. I don't care if you started a t-shirt company and you sold three, three t-shirts, right? You've taken the initiative to do something that nobody asked you to do. Those are the people who are going to be, as you mentioned earlier, building the business for you and letting you sort of drive the ship because in order for them to do that, they have to take initiative. As long as they're waiting for you or somebody in your executive team to tell them what to do, then they're never going to take that initiative. They're never going to be able to build your business for you. So I think initiative is incredibly important. And I think third is just something that you really can't teach, which is just the drive to have something that's not just a normal career. Like a lot of people look at their job as a job and they look at it as a way to make money and cash their paycheck every other Friday and they can't wait for the weekend, then that's totally cool. The more those people you hire, the more you're going to really hamstring your business long term. You want to hire people that look at their career as a chance to make a mark, um, to build great relationships, to do things extraordinary. And if they have initiative and they aren't selfish and they have, you know, and they basically have that intestinal fortitude and drive and desire to create something that's more than an average everyday job, you have the makings of somebody that can be incredibly successful regardless of what their age or experience is. Yeah. You know, double click on that. I'm curious, I'd love to get your take. If you find that in someone, but their their past experience or their technical skill doesn't necessarily map exactly to what you're looking for, will you still, you know, take a chance on them and, and try to and try to train them? Or is it are, are you at the point where, you know, role fit and, and previous experience is also it's kind of like that fourth pillar that you're looking for? I think it all depends upon what level you're hiring. You know, it's like it, if somebody's more of a raw talent. Um, let's say they were a nightclub promoter in college, but they, they, they hustled and they went door to door and they won an entry level sales role. Sure. I'll take a chance on them. Am I going to send somebody in who's never spoken to a large enterprise and 90 days in after they're onboarded, send them in the Coca-Cola to pitch Susie? No, 
right? So I think there's certain um, areas, the more senior areas, also the more technical areas. If somebody needs to be an engineer or a coder, they need a certain type of experience. What I will say though, is that once somebody is in and they're proving themselves, I don't care how many years they've been at the company. I don't care how much they're making. If I see that they are somebody who can really transform the organization, I'll promote them five levels up and put them in a position that they would have to work 10 to 15 years in another company to get to. And when I've done that, more often than not, it's been the right move. Uh, we've done it several times at Suzy where we have people you know, in their late 20s running departments alongside people who are in their early to mid 40s and they're doing just as well. And I don't really look at their age uh, or anything like that I look at it's a pure meritocracy in terms of what they've earned and what they've built at, while they've been in our organization. Totally, that's that's great advice for people out there. Um, a, a quick couple, like pair of questions around an investor lesson learned and a mentor mentor advice. So you know, you said you've raised a lot of money for Susie and other businesses. What's been the best, you know, biggest lesson you've learned from an investor, and then a you know the best piece of advice you've gotten from a mentor along the way? So I think from the fundraising process, it's just about listening to the market. You know, if you meet with five investors and you hear the same thing over and over again, your first instinct was gonna, is going to be, they have no idea what they're talking about. They're going to regret it one day. And that may be the case, but they're speaking for the market. And what they're looking for, because it is a herd mentality, and especially in venture capital, where they are all trying to get in on the same deals and they're all reading the same information. If you want to raise money, you have to play the game and you have to set up your company with the right you know, financial um, you know, profile and unit economics to be able to raise capital. Uh, and if you don't have that makeup, you're not going to be able to raise capital and you're not going to be able to sell your way into it. Um, in terms of working with investors, um, my biggest lesson learned has been just avoid surprises at all costs. They have seen it all. Most you know, investors who are savvy and have, and have invested in, in many companies prior have seen companies fail. They've seen companies succeed. They've seen everything in between. What they don't want is people who are just fast talking them and trying to hide issues. So anytime there's an issue, you know, be incredibly transparent about it inform your investors, seek their help and advice. And that's how you build the right level of, of trust over time to allow you guys to get through the good times and the bad times. That's a great advice. You've had several stages in your career, so it's, it's tough to pick one point, but if you could go back to when you first started and, and told yourself a couple of things, you know, still having to go through all the trials and tribulations, what would you, what would you tell yourself? I mean, geez, so many things. I think one thing is never judge a person by their badge at a conference. So what I mean by that is, and now, you know, maybe it's a virtual conference now, right? But I remember when I was younger, I would go to conferences and I would just have a, a, a laser-like focus on companies that had Procter & Gamble and Nike on their badges. And if they worked for a company that I had never heard of before, I would almost just I don't want to say disregard them, but it wouldn't be at my focus at the lunch table or at the water cooler chats because I didn't think that they'd be able to help my business tomorrow. But the reality is that business doesn't work that way. The person who's at Nike today could be at a nonprofit tomorrow and vice versa. And ultimately, you want to build a strong network and a wide, you know, disparate network of relationships with people who you feel that you can connect to, have like-minded interests, regardless of where they work. And you want to fight like hell to keep those relationships strong over a long period of time. I would not have been able to get Susie off the ground if there weren't people who I can call up um, that were that were willing to license a software tool that they had never heard of before based upon the fact that they trusted me. I I had enough relationships to be able to get Susie off the ground. I wish I had had more of them. Uh, and I wish I had a more long-term focus on my network uh, because that ultimately becomes one of your biggest assets that you have in business. Yeah, that's a great point. So we're gonna we're gonna shift to a little thing I'm I'm calling on the show. It's, I'm still trying it out, but the wellness corner. So okay. I think of I think of wellness as as a stack. So I like to layer meditation, nutrition, sleep, fitness. I think when you layer them together, it creates a compounding effect of of personal wellness and and productivity. So I'm gonna go through a couple different categories around wellness, and I'd love for you to share just you know how you think about it, if you do anything throughout the day for it, any products and brands that you can't live without. So the first one is morning routine. So how do you typically start the day? So I'm not one of those people who, you know, has that incredible morning routine that wakes up at five o'clock in the morning and does their meditation and, you know, reflects in journals. I just don't roll that way. I'm not really a morning person. 
um, at all. I do most of my best work at night. Um, in the morning, it's really just trying to get my bearings and trying to really get my head straight on what the two to three most important things I want to accomplish uh, that day are. I'm a big coffee person, can't live without my Starbucks, um, but really just try to um, maybe take some time to go for a walk or go outside to clear my head um, and get those two to three things down um, and then basically come back and be ready to go for the day. Um, but I, you know, I generally get out of bed around seven thirty-eight, not four thirty-five, like some of the, you know, super powered CEOs that you might be talking to. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to look at the archetype. I'm also not a morning person. Like I, I thrive from like nine to 1 AM, like 9 yeah. PM to 1 AM. And, and the media almost portrays that as like worse than people who like get up at 5 a.m. But I think when you tap into what you're good at, you just, you just over index on that. Yeah, so I totally agree. Totally. All right. The second one is uh, nutrition, eating. Do you do intermittent fasting? Any, any kind of diets that you stick to or is it, is it kind of all over the place? It's kind of all over the place. I don't really have a intermittent fasting uh, routine. Have not really tried it. Um, it's just something where I know my body. I know sometimes I get, um, you know, out of shape or out of sorts, I try to rein myself back in. Um, I use um, a scale um, called Withings, which tracks your weight on an ongoing basis. I'm all about data. So I try to benchmark over time to see how I'm tracking, how I was versus a year ago. What are the trends in terms of the times a year that might be trouble spots for me so I can be more keen to it. Um, and I obviously know the impact of the right diet is on your overall performance in business. And I just try to keep my you know, keep, keep, make sure I pay attention to that. Yeah. Next one is, is fitness exercise, working out. Do you, do you have anything you stick to religiously? Um, I'm the type of person that it doesn't come natural to me to want to work out. And the way that I've been able to be successful at a consistent fitness routine is just having a personal trainer because I, you know, my mind is always going to business. What, what can I do next for my business? Um, but I know I'm also very schedule oriented and I, I know if I have a trainer on the schedule, even if it's in the morning and I'm clearly not a morning person, I will go. So scheduling a, a personal trainer, having them show up, knowing that I have to go no matter what is really what is the forcing function to me for me to make sure that I get into the right fitness routine. The next one is sleep. So do you, do you need a certain amount of sleep? You said you're creative at night or, or most effective at night. So what time do you typically get to bed? I usually get to bed around one and I usually wake up around seven, seven thirty. So six and a half hours more on the weekends for sure. Um, but that's, I try not to work as much over the weekends. Uh, Saturday morning, I'll do a little bit Sunday night. I, I is critical time for me, um, for a couple hours, usually like seven to 9 PM to really look at my week ahead and look at my schedule. Those are the two times during the weekend I'll try to work, but for the rest of the weekend, I really try to focus on my kids and family, et cetera. Um, but that's kind of the way I look at my week and, you know, definitely try to get a little more sleep over the weekend than I'm able to during the week for sure. Although, I mean, that's this pandemic and it's kind of throwing everything into whack, right? Like the, the, the not having a routine is for some people is a death sentence in terms of their ability to be able to keep up their, you know, the personal mental health. It's, it's been hard for a lot of people because it's just hard to, you know, differentiate between when you're working and when you're not when you're sleeping, when you're awake, et cetera. Yeah. It's so hard to know when to lean in, when to not. I, I totally agree. All right. Last one in the, in this is the, your content diet. So newsletters, podcasts, micro content that you do daily, weekly, or uh, books that you've been reading and, and would love to recommend. Yeah. So I have a, uh, a list I've built over time, um, on Twitter called people who know stuff, which is basically just my curated list of a thousand people that I am interested in knowing what they have to say and and the articles that they're sharing and that and that alone has been enough for me to be able to really have my finger on the pulse of the the marketplaces and the businesses that matter to me um, and then what i try to do is i use a tool called pocket which allows me to take any article or any tweet that i find interesting and uh, just kind of organize it and then when i have time to dig into all those articles uh, you know that emanate from those tweets i do so in, and I organize them by topics. Okay. You know, the topics that matter most to me, whether it's SaaS or, or startups or, you know, youth culture. And then when it's time for me to dig in, whether I have a project or I just want to learn or I want to write, I will dive into that content and consume it, um, you know, at scale to then be able to fill my brain up with the right types of ideas to create that presentation. And that's kind of the, the very simple approach to consuming content. Um, I will read books from time to time if people who I 
huge respect said, you have to read this and then I'll take the time to do it. But I'm not seeking out business books where I'm knocking back, you know, three to four a month or anything like that. Um, I'm much more about, because I find, you know, for me in the world I live in, in terms of a new consumer, it's gotta be timely. Timeliness is everything and books aren't as timely. So that's been, you know, generally things are changing so quickly. It's like, if you read a book about the experience economy right now, it wouldn't necessarily be valuable to you. Right. So I think now more than ever, I, I really try to, you know, read content that's, that's more timely. That's a great point. The, the Twitter list is a great idea. We'll have to check that out. I'll, I'll make sure to link up the Twitter list for our, for our listeners to yeah, check it out. I'm happy to share the, my particular list if people want to check it out. Cool. Um, three more questions for you, then we'll get you out of here. So the, the first one is around, um, any, any exciting trends, if you were to put your customer hat on or like an angel investor hat or, you know, your, your serial entrepreneurs, if you're going to start something else, like what are some trends or areas right now that you're seeing outside of SaaS, outside of research that excite you? So I definitely think um, plant-based food, plant-based meats, I think it's, that has a massive upside, massive potential moving forward. I just think the technology and the product is getting so good that if a consumer can eat something that is infinitely more healthy to them and they can have the same experience, it just becomes an incredible arbitrage opportunity for so many companies in what is a, a trillion dollar industry. So I think you know the change happening in that space is dramatic. Um, I think you're gonna see continued um, disruption in the education space. Um, I think that you look at higher education right now and many people are questioning, especially at this very moment, but in general, what is the value of a college degree? You know, I didn't really learn anything in college that I applied to my entrepreneurial um, journey. You look at where all the value is being created globally, especially here in the United States, and it's with the technology companies. I just heard this morning that Tesla is worth more than the five biggest airlines combined, right? So who is Tesla hiring for? And they are they looking to hire people that were educated by reading textbooks that were written in the 80s? Yeah, definitely not. Not. So I think, um, you know, there's just going to be so much room for disruption there. And what we know is the traditional educational journey is going to be thrown on its ear and there's going to be a lot of winners coming out of that. And I think, you know, this pandemic is really an accelerant to that, uh, obviously. And then lastly, anything just that deals with shifting things to the cloud, shifting the e-commerce is going to continue to happen. I mean, the, the notion that so many of these retailers that even have been able to survive this far will be able to without dramatically evolving their model to be much more experiential in nature versus just being a place where you go and buy stuff. I mean, that's that will no longer exist. Uh, so I think, you know, you see it in Shopify's stock price. I think you're going to see so much more being driven to e-commerce because we really are still just in the early days of that. Yeah, I totally agree with all of those. So th these are the final two questions. We ask these to every guest, so I'm pumped to get your take on these. The first one is the startup manifesto. A lot of lessons probably sprinkled in some of your other answers, but if you were to start, if you were to write a startup manifesto with five of the most important key lessons or pitfalls to avoid when starting out, what would they be? Um, never underestimate the value of cash, <laughs> which probably be one. Um, two is people are everything. Uh, three, I definitely believe in the notion of done being better than perfect. Um, for sure. It's just too many people perseverate over decisions, analysis, paralysis, they don't move fast enough and speed is so incredibly important. Um, four, you know, the customer is everything really just, you need to understand your customer and everything they're thinking and feeling if that's who you're building your business from. And five is just never quit. I mean, just continue to pound and pound. I'm sure so many of the founders and CEOs of you interview say similar things, but that's because there's not really necessarily magic to it. It's, uh, you know, if you, you know, have a good balance sheet, you know what your customers want, you have a great team and you don't quit, you can probably build a great business, but there's only a select few that can put all those things together. Yeah, that's a great way to say it. And then the last, the second question of the last two is not a nomination. So this has been a fantastic way for the show to grow and, and really expose us to some great founders. So it's your turn to nominate another founder that's either a friend, colleague, or mentor of yours that you would like to see on the show in the future. I think you should interview Jonah Goodhart, who was the founder of a company called Moat that was acquired a couple of years ago from Oracle uh, that has had a prolific uh, entrepreneurial career. And I think he had, would have incredible lessons to share uh, with your audience. Awesome. Yeah, that, that's great. We'll, we'll get them on for sure. Um, thank you for that. So bef before we wrap, I'd love to just acknowledge you for a second. I think, you know, when listening to the story, and I hope 
as listeners listen to this, your vision and that ability to detect the light bulbs is so interesting, right? And very inspiring. I think a lot of people can look back on their career and, and try to put the pieces together like they knew what they were doing. But it sounds like you really did see around some corners that, you know, other people might not have seen or you were the first one there. And I think that's that's a quality that few have and it's really rare. So I'm really pumped that I got the chance to talk to you and I'm going to be a continued supporter of Susie as we go. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks so much for the opportunity and uh, enjoying listening to your podcast and can't wait to see how this one turns out. Of course. Um, before you jump, do you want to plug Susie's contact and uh, social handles for people to follow? Sure. I mean, the easiest way to find anything out you want to about Susie is just Susie.com. S-U-Z-Y.com. Awesome. Matt Britton, founder of Suzy, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to that episode with Matt Britton of Suzy. If you want to support the show, there's a couple quick things you could do that would really help us out. One, subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts. If you go on Apple Podcasts, please leave us a five-star rating and a couple sentence positive review on why the show inspired you. These ratings and reviews are super important and they signal to Apple that they should put our show in front of other people like you that might like it. Two, follow us on Instagram at Founder Podcast. Each week we put out teasers, audio clips, and important quotes from the episode. And lastly, check out our website as a mission control for the show. Go to thefounderpod.com. We have a page on there called Special Offers where we link up all the discount codes across our founders' companies, as well as the books and resources that have been recommended. I hope you enjoyed that episode and are looking forward to the next one. Until then, I'm Callaway, and this is The Founder. Founder.